Good morning, and thank you, Crystal. Great presence of God um, in the worship. And um, firstly, I would like to say special thanks to guess who? You won't guess. Little Lumi for allowing her mum to come up to the front after a long break and be leading the service and joining in the worship as well, worship leading. So, no, that was good. Thank you, Crystal. And let's continue the attitude of um, worship. God is here with us and wants to speak to us um, through his word. We'll continue. Um, maybe, uh, Tommy and Marcus, if we could have the screen lights off, that would be great. Thank you. Um, we'll continue with our study of the book of Revelation. And I realized and had to double check this morning that as per plan, um, unless God th changes things, which he's welcome to do, um, this will be the last time I'm sharing on revelations um, in the English service until next year. Because next Sunday is what it is we heard. And then uh, we're getting close to Christmas. In two weeks, I'll be sharing the same message, God willing, in the Finnish service. And um, then we'll have the uh, Christmas um, meetings and celebrations and uh, the first uh, meeting in the new year, which happens to be on the 1st of the 1st, 23. I will be sharing again, God willing, in both Finnish and English service, but um, I'm not quite sure yet what I'm going to share on, but I don't think it'll be revelations. I think it's something more. Uh, to um, help us move into the new year and the new phase and what God wants for us to be looking at. So now I will continue with uh, the book of Revelation looking at chapters 10 and 11. So last time we looked at um, the first interlude or interruption or like an in-between summary section, overarching section, which was chapter 7. And now we'll continue um, with another one, um, which... I'll put summarized um, in a bit of a strange way, because it is a bit of a strange interlude, eating a book and two witnesses. And there's more to it, but we'll have a look. But first we'll remind ourselves again about uh, the importance and the um, blessing promised to us. Blessed is, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Um, this, uh, these two chapters, 10 and 11, they are quite challenging. In fact, uh, people who've spent their lifetimes studying uh, the book of Revelation, um, some of them comment that this is the most difficult or challenging section in Revelation. I think I said something similar last time, so certainly these are quite challenging chapters to interpret and may seem rather strange, and I certainly don't want to propose that I've got the final answer, yeah, because we don't. Uh, but we'll have a look, and um, it's a bit challenging. Um, it was good that we could um, come in in the sense of a uh, presence of God in worship, and certainly my, uh, my, eye was, uh, my mind was cast into the throne room of God, and even that one of the last songs we sung, which was clearly out of the book of Revelation, and um, worthy is the Lamb, uh, worthy of our worship. He is in control. And even in these couple of rather strange chapters, and um, you could say somewhat depressing chapters, I believe there is a message from God. He wants to speak to us, not just from a verse here or a verse there from the book of Revelation through the whole book. So in um, submission to him, let's continue studying the book. And may the Lord bless you, whether you're here in person or watching online um, live or later on. I do know that even though we have our numbers are not very great here, but there's quite a few people who are watching um, online at some point as well. So may the Lord bless all of us. So... Um, the message in chapter 10 and 11 being um, an interlude uh, is uh, probably overarching other segments in the book of Revelation, and I'll touch on that as we go on, um, but um, like a summary of what's happening concurrently. Um, that's how many people understand it. And it starts off um, uh, John writing down, I saw, 
and then we'll have a look in a moment what he saw. But um, again, to set the scene, the overview, um, this is the same uh, um, table that I showed last time, except the green bit, the green line is highlighted, is different, which is the one we're looking at today. So backtracking, we've had chapter six. We look, uh, we've got the description of the six seals being opened of the scroll that's uh, given into Christ's hands. Chapter 7 we looked at last time about the 144,000 sealed and the great multitudes of the two groups. Then chapters 8 and 9, uh, which we're not touching on, is the seventh seal and then the six trumpet uh, judgments. And now then um, chapters 10 and 11, um, we'll look at the message now. And um, actually at the end of chapter 11, which we are not going to go into, the seventh trumpet is sounded uh, and then things go from there. As a bit of an overview of what's um, happening, the events in chapters 10 and 11, um, we see a mighty angel uh, with a little scroll or little book. Um, and John is asked to eat the scroll and that leads to him being commissioned or recommissioned to prophesy more about what is coming. Then there's a strange bit, two verses long, about measuring the temple, but leaving parts of it out, and we'll have a bit of a look at that, and followed immediately by two witnesses, strange-looking guys, um, who are dressed in sackcloth. And um, they, um, if ever there was someone or someone's whose life was up and down, uh, it's these two guys. Um, they have amazing powers from God, and they meet a horrible end, but in the end, uh, they are very victorious, so we'll see that. And uh, there's a huge big earthquake at the end. So that may sound a bit confusing. And um, before going into actually looking at the, the contents um, as per the summary, I want to step back at this point of time and make some further comments on interpreting. I mean, first things, um, I mentioned this, I think, before. We've got the two now summarizing them. There are many views and many interpretations that different scholars of the Bible um, have. On the one hand, you have those who follow a fairly literal uh, reading and inter interpretation to the other end, and I'm not covering what uh, we covered in the first session uh, way back when, then very symbolic or allegorical inter interpretation. And I certainly find when I've been reading again in the last week or two around this, my little head getting really, really confused. Uh, particularly when you look at all these symbolic interpretations and one person says this, another one says that, etc., etc. Um, and I think there is something uh, we can certainly apply some of that uh, to our benefit. Uh, on this, I'm inclined to go more with a, with a sort of a sensible, if you like, a fairly literal view, um, a futuristic look at what the meaning is. And I am sort of borrowing some ideas um, from uh, one uh, Finnish Pentecostal author, uh, Olavi Kokkonen, who's been studying the book of Revelation in a lot of detail. I don't necessarily agree with him on everything, but I think he's got a very thorough sort of structured um, approach. And uh, on that, and he's not the only one who's saying the same thing, so it's not some particular Finnish sort of doctrine, so don't worry. A lot of um, American, Australian, British uh, authors have similar views and have had over the centuries. Now, now, to go further, um, to set the scene and a bit of a background, um, I want to have a look uh, in a broad uh, sense about the tribulation period and where that fits in with uh, the prophecy in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament prophecy and uh, specifically um, Daniel's prophecy for that he received from God. Um, he didn't make it up. It's a prophecy from God concerning his people, i.e., the Israelites or the Jewish people. And um, this is not the only interpretation, uh, but I think it does make a lot of sense. You know, so I'm not proposing that this is necessarily the, the final truth, but I do believe that this has um, um, a lot to offer us and does help to explain a lot of things. So with the uh, terminology, this particular template that I used to put those various titles up. Um, I wanted to put more bubbles, but I reached the limit. There are more terms, 
for the tribulation, great tribulation, wrath of God, the great wrath, Jacob's trouble, which has got a particularly Jewish flavor, and we'll look at that. Um, times of trouble is a simplified sort of version that Paulson uses, for instance. The Old Testament prophets um, often refer to the day of the Lord, the great and mighty day of the Lord. And um, then uh, there were some really gloomy predictions coming, the hour of testing, the Daniel seventh week, 70th week, and so on. So it gets a bit confusing. And then <clears throat> what we're looking at, and um, this is, okay, some people don't see it this way. They see the whole thing as more symbolic. Um, but uh, I am taking this view, um, and I think there's a merit to it and helps us to understand when we look at the contents of chapters 10 and 11. So backtracking a little bit, looking at this tribulation period in the light of um, the prophecy that Daniel received way back before when the Israelites were coming to the end of their Babylonian captivity. He was praying and fasting and reading the scriptures and saw that, okay, the 70 years is almost up. So he was pleading before God um, and then he was given um, uh, all sorts of um, revelations um, and um, visions from God. And indeed, uh, in chapter 9 in particular, um, there's something very specific about 70 weeks being given to your people, i.e. the Israelites. And um, in a prophetic sense, that 70 weeks is understood as 70 weeks of years. So 70 times 7 years is 490 years. Now, we can get into all sorts of knots, uh, but in briefly, briefly, it is understood, um, and it's based on which I'm not reading and going through, we'd spend the whole hour uh, just going through that, um, that the different stages in the prophecy given to Daniel. And um, the first 49 years, or the first seven weeks, uh, and the big thing, so seven are the weeks, seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week makes totally 70 weeks given to Daniel's people. The first seven weeks, which is 49 years, seven times seven is 49, um, we'll uh, start it from the announcement by the Babylonian king um, that, um, that um, Jerusalem can be rebuilt. And there's different people have looked at the um, history uh, and so forth. I'm not going into that exactly what year that was. Um, but it was 49 years given from the announcement that Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And over that seven weeks of years, um, 49 years, indeed, um, the Jerusalem was rebuilt, not to its former glory, but it was rebuilt. And then there's this period of 62 years, um, and it says, at the end of which the Messiah, the promised Messiah, will be cut off. So that is understood to be the time of Jesus' crucifixion. And then what I have not put there, I sort of realized a bit late, uh, but it doesn't matter. It is understood in the prophetic sense that at that point, after the 62 weeks, the clock for the Jewish people was stopped. And it's still stopped. And it will be restarted at the time of the tribulation, which will be one week. So that's why they, it's called the Daniel's 70th week, or the final seven-year period, which is the time of the tribulation overall. And then that period of tribulation is broken into half. Um, the first half um, being what's called just the period of, now this is where the terminology gets really confusing. It's the, the basic, the tribulation, the start of tribulation. Um, and, um, and the second half is the great tribulation or the period of wrath of God. So the first half is bad, and the second half is a lot worse. In fact, from the Jewish point of view, the first half doesn't look too bad. Um, it is understood, uh, again, I'm just summarizing a lot of information, that, um, and this is really interpreting um, the, that last week from the Jewish point of view. After all, it was given to Daniel as part of the history of the Jewish people. So at the end of times, and um, this fits in particularly with the pre-tribulation view of rapture, again, which may or may not be um, the final truth. But in that sense, if that's true, and I hope it is, then the church would have been taken up before the tribulation starts. Be that as it may. 
um, the prophetic interpretation then is in the first half of the last week, the first three and a half weeks, um, Israel um, makes a covenant with the Antichrist, who's already then appeared or on the political scene and seems very attractive um, and someone who promises a lot and uh, seems to bring a great time of peace. And we know all the Oslo Accords and uh, all sorts of efforts and Camp David Accords and whatever else, trying to bring peace to the Middle East, they aren't, they aren't working. Even in the last week, there have been stories of people being shot and killed and, and rockets flying, etc., etc. Every human effort so far has failed to bring peace to Jerusalem or the Middle East. But then, at the end of the time, uh, the tribulation period, the, the person comes who then turns out to be the Antichrist who seems to have the solution. And the Jewish people make a covenant or agreement with him, and that allows the Jerusalem temple to be rebuilt. Again, this is one point of view. Some people think it's symbolic that, that there will be no literal temple, but bear with me. Uh, because I think um, that this uh, also makes a lot of sense. And the offerings are or the animal sacrificed, sacrifices are recommenced. And a lot of the Jewish people today, they firmly believe that there will be a time that the literal temple, the third temple, will be rebuilt, and uh, apparently even implements for sacrifice have been collected and made ready so that can commence when the time comes. At the moment, it seems totally impossible uh, because the place of the temple is preoccupied. Um, but offerings are commenced, uh, recommenced, and there seems to be a promised time of great peace. And everyone goes, you beaut. But then, halfway through the overall tribulation period, at the start of the great tribulation, the Antichrist turns around and um, breaks the covenant, stops the sacrifices, and in fact, um, brings some sort of sacrilege to the temple and pronounces himself to be God, with a small g. And, um, and in fact, the Jews are expelled and um, they go into hiding. Now, this is, again, a lot of interpretation. Summarizing again, but adding a bit more. Um, in the last uh, three and a half years, the great tribulation, the great wrath of God, the Antichrist uh, turns around um, and shows his true colors. At that period uh, that I mentioned, and we'll see in chapter 11 very shortly, um, are the two witnesses in sackcloth and, um, and also what we won't go into this time from chapter 12 in um, the Revelation, it talks about um, in, um, in, uh, in prophetic terms about a woman who bears a male child and um, interesting things happen there, escaping to the desert, to the place that God's prepared for the woman and so on. So we'll look at that next year. But at the end of the last week, at the end of the Great Tribulation, the last three and a half years, Antichrist himself is judged as per later on in the Revelation of the Book of Revelation, and Israel, then the remnant, turns to God. So that's how um, a lot of that has been interpreted in uh, this interpretation, and I think that does make some sense. Now, We'll pause that uh, for now and get back to the text. So starting from chapter 10, and um, we do need to move fairly quickly, but I will read, and there's an interesting description. Um, I saw another strong angel coming down from out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and left on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heavens and the, th and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. 
but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants the prophet, and so on. It continues. I won't read the whole chapter. So a lot happening there, and um, things that are difficult to understand, uh, but it's quite a vivid picture of a strong angel coming from heaven and with um, a strange sort of clothing and um, things surrounding him. So obviously, um, referring back to what we've looked earlier in the book of Revelation, charting with, starting, charting with, starting with chapter one, the vision of Jesus. This is remarkably similar with the rainbow and the clouds and the white clothing or white uh, face as snow and the feet as pillars of fire, etc. So some people do interpret that this so-called strong angel uh, is uh, in fact Jesus. But we don't know, because it actually it says a strong angel. So we leave it at that, a strong angel or certainly a very high ranking um, supernatural angelic being, um, potentially even Jesus, but we don't know, so we move on. But certainly there are a lot of um, descriptions there which bring to mind, which I won't um, go through now, back to the revelation of Jesus and also what the Old Testament prophets saw, uh, descriptions of the Son of Man or Jesus um, and so forth. And the rainbow, God's promise not to flood the earth again, the whole earth, um, his promise with us. The fiery pillars are interesting and can speak to us a lot of things. Uh, I know it really touched me, the description in uh, chapter 1 of Jesus uh, last year when I thought of the uh, bronze as in fire, so in a really glowing metal, uh, so it's quite vivid. But also um, that can remind us of um, the pillar of cloud and uh, the pillar of, um, um, of the fire uh, that was leading the Israelites out of Egypt during the Exodus. So from the Israelites' point of view, the pillar of fire at night, it was their protection and guidance and leading. But for the Egyptians who followed, it separated them from the people of God and the presence of God, in fact, destroyed them um, in the Nile, in the Red Sea rather, not the Nile, Red Sea. So um, we can mull over these things and be reminded of a whole lot of teachings from throughout the Bible and God's work through history. But let's move on. Um, then, as I read, then the angel cried out with a loud voice. Like we said before, there's a lot of noise at the end times and a lot of noise in heaven. So the angel cries with a loud noise like a lion roars. So it's a mighty sort of roar. I'm not sure if you've heard lions roaring. Um, but yeah, it's pretty mighty. And then it says, really strange, and the seven thunders spoke. And it doesn't say what the seven thunders are, just the seven thunders spoke, as it was self-evident, which is not self-evident to us at all, except that we know that uh, there are a number of um, places in the Bible, including the book of Revelation, when God uh, is present or seen, Peals of thunder and lightning um, sort of um, are heard and seen, including on Mount Sinai when mm -hmm. the law was given, etc. So there are some special seven thunders of God. And then John starts to write down and was told to stop. Don't write down. So it remains a mystery to us. Well, we've got no idea what the seven thunders said. They must have said something in a language and speech that John could understand because he was about to write them down, but he was stopped from doing so. So why was John allowed to hear that, but not allowed to tell anyone else? We don't know. It's one of these uh, mysteries of God. So there's more to um, God's uh, plan and outworking, including, and I think this is a big, good take-home message for us, um, rather than dwelling on that, God has everything un in his hand. God has everything under control. There are more things in God's world and what's going to happen than what he has chosen for whatever reason to tell us. So, his final and full plan is not revealed to us humans until at the end of time, when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Then we will understand 
Ah, oh, oh wow. Is that what they said? Is that what that was all about? I'm glad we didn't know that before. God in his wisdom knows what to tell us and what we don't need to know. Our human minds are funny. We are intrigued by mystery and something strange. I forgot to put that on, but that's fine. But the take-home message is hidden things of God belong to God. Full stop. Move on. So let's not try to speculate and make up all sorts of theories if God hasn't chosen to tell us. Okay. Now, then, the angel, after the thunders had spoken, the mighty angel says that there's no more delay until the mystery of God will be revealed. Now, that's an interesting thing. In fact, this morning, uh, not that it helps you now, but I'm telling you anyway, unless you were here this morning, uh, in the Finnish service, um, Pastor Kirsty was speaking very, uh, very anointedly around the mystery of God. And that's a big concept uh, in the Bible. And um, I certainly won't be able to do any justice to it now, so it's just skipping again very briefly. But God's plan for the ages, right from the beginning... It wasn't a surprise to God that Satan and his angels fell when into rebellion. It wasn't a surprise to God that Satan enticed the first humans, Adam and Eve, into disobedience and rebellion against God. God wasn't caught by surprise, and he didn't go, oops, didn't see that coming. He knew, and he still created us, and he still gave us a free will. So that by choice, he was hoping, like any good parent hopes, that their child will love them and worship God. Well, I'm talking about children worshipping us now, but us as God's children worshipping him. And um, there's the whole then plan of the ages and the Old Testament prophets and... um, and, um, and preachers and lawyers and starting with Moses and everyone, they did not know, and the disciples of Jesus did not know and understand the, the full mystery or the plan of God. Paul writes how he was shown through a heavenly vision, God's plan, God's mystery, and I'm sure he didn't understand it fully, but from his writings that the Holy Spirit inspired him to write, we understand more about the mystery. And there are many aspects to it, but just sticking here just briefly, and there's a hint here as well, um, when the uh, angel uh, swears uh, that there will be no delay no longer, and uh, chapter 10, verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Now, That word in here, translated as preached, apparently in the original, uh, it actually uses the word um, in the Greek that where our word evangelism or the gospel comes from. So literally it means bring good news or the gospel as good news, as good news to the prophets. So it is referring to the good news, the mystery of the good news, God's plan for the ages, that is finished. Um, Jesus was meant to come, and Christmas will be celebrating that again, and that's lovely, but it's a great reminder for us. Jesus came not only as a babe, um, smaller than Lumi, rock of my baby, but he came to die for our sins voluntarily, and he cried on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And before that, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And he chose to die on the cross for our sins. He didn't commit suicide. He allowed himself to be killed for us, our sins, and poured out his blood uh, as an acceptable sacrifice to cover the sins of the world so we can be free. So, and then Paul was shown that, hang on, now this plan actually also includes the Gentiles, not just the Jewish Messiah, but we can be grafted in with them into that God's olive tree 
And we are also part of the same salvation. Hallelujah. Praise God. Otherwise, what are we doing here? And um, that gospel is still being preached. And even during the time of tribulation, it's still being preached under hard times. And God is wanting, begging people to come to him. Which reminds me, a um, little sidestep. This, again, this morning's meeting, we had a really good anointed uh, meeting this morning. And um, uh, Brother Reya was sharing from Psalm 100. Uh, one of our hymn book hymns is based on Psalm 100. So joy through to the Lord, all the earth, etc. And um, it caught my interest, the last verse of Psalm 100. It says, for the Lord is good. And this phrase, his loving kindness is everlasting. Or another translation, his grace is eternal or lasts forever. So it took my mind to this, like this message right now and all the gloomy things and depressing things. But to remember at the same time, God's grace, God's loving kindness is everlasting. It doesn't stop at the start of the revelation or halfway through God's love, his grace is everlasting, goes forever and ever and ever, infinity. And it's still there. So that is part of the good news, the mystery of the good news, which we have been given the immense privilege to know more about or understand more fully. We don't understand it fully, but more fully than um, some of the Old Testament prophets. Um, on this, Isaiah wrote, uh, this is one of my favorite passages, and I only read a little bit, Isaiah 52, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns, and it continues. And a little bit later on in Isaiah 61, and this passage Jesus quoted when he started his preaching ministry uh, as an adult, he was handed, as you might remember, uh, the scroll of Isaiah. He opened the scroll and read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. And it continues. Um, so this is the good news. Jesus is good news. And the mystery of the good news, which is preached to the servants, his prophets, will be completed, will be finished when at the time that the seventh trumpet sounds, which is not yet in our study. God's purpose is the kingdom of God. And a little glimpse ahead, which is not part of today's message as such, but when the seventh angel actually blows his trumpet, um, and I'll read just one verse from chapter 11, verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, again loud voices, the kingdom of the world has come, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And then the 24 elders worshipped again. The, God's purpose is the kingdom of God. Then in this soon, at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, at the end of the great tribulation, it has come. It's completed. Uh, what is still a mystery to us will be fully revealed um, then, and the work completed. And we can rejoice in that and look forward to that when we are in Christ. And that's only possible through the work of Christ on the cross. So there's no Christmas, no point having a Christmas in the Christian sense without having Easter. And there's no Easter without Christmas. Jesus came to die for our sins, but death could not hold him, and God raised him from the death, and we have this same resurrection power working mightily in us who believe. Praise God. Paul finishes his long, complicated letter to the Romans with these really interesting, um, powerful words from Romans 16:25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience in faith. 
to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. What a conclusion to the book of Romans. It teaches about righteousness and salvation. The mystery has been known, known to all nations. So it takes us back to the fact that we still have work to do. Not everybody knows. So there's still work to be done to let people know the mystery which has now been revealed. It is the good news for the world. But unfortunately, they don't accept it. Many people don't. Then we move on. And um, then John is given that little, little scroll, which is in the hand of, um, hand of the um, mighty angel, to take it and eat it. Now, there's speculation what the contents of that scroll are. Now, some people say, and again, we're not told specifics, so we don't know, full stop. So I could stop there, um, but I won't quite just this yet. Some people say it's the same scroll that we saw in chapter 5 in the hands of Christ, sealed with the seven seals. But now the seven seals have been opened and some of the trumpets, etc. Now it's opened and now the open scroll is given to John. So there's strong parallels to um, what happened in chapter 5. Um, others say that it contains now part of the judgment, some it's already happened, so it's a smaller book because uh, there's less to come, or it only contains part of the judgment, or that in fact the scroll is the good news message in some shape or form. We don't know, but there's a message in an open book, so it's meant to be read, it's meant to be revealed. And really strange sort of prophetic illustration, and it is not the first time it happens in the Bible, John's told to take this book and start eating. Really weird. And I pinched this from the internet. I think really quite good artistic impression, if you <laughs> literally have not Well, he said he ate it. And what happened? In his mouth, it was sweet as honey. But when it got as far as his stomach, it was bitter. So we can interpret from that and understand from that, that the word of God, the message of God, is sweet. And often the word of God is compared, particularly in the Psalms, etc. It's your word is sweet as honey. Okay, honey is not too good to eat too much if you've got diabetes, but otherwise it's, it's nice and can be healthy. I put honey drops in my eyes to stop them from drying. So it's got good uses <laughs> and seems to work. And uh, anyway, the message of God is sweet, but, 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 sometimes, sometimes the message isn't quite so nice. And certainly, if you need to prophesy by judgment, then Jeremiah is one of the ultimate ones that I really feel sorry for. His decades-long ministry was just judgment, judgment, judgment. It'd be awful, but he was faithful. And God was with him. Anyway, sidestepping. And he was told then to prophesy more to many nations, peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So again, the gospel needs to be still spread. And um, there's message to come. I said that this is the first time in the Bible uh, that someone's eaten a book. In Ezekiel, a couple of passages just to give the idea. Chapter 2, verse 9, Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. When he spread it out before me, it was writ written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentations, mournings, and woe. Chapter 3, verse 1, Then he said to me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go. Speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me this scroll. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with this scroll, which I am giving you. Then I ate it, and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But in continues to say that when it got to his stomach, it was bitter. Um, some, I saw on the internet when I was looking for some pictures and things that someone in their series on the Revelation had a title, Have You Eaten Any Books Lately? So I didn't pinch that, uh, but I'm just mentioning it verbally. But made me think, though, even in that reminder from Revelations 1, 3, hear, read, and obey the message of the book. So in that sort of symbolic sense, 
have we eaten the Bible? Not physically, I'm not going to start chewing on it. And I don't think it'll be sweet as honey if I just start chewing it now. So we're not taking that part literally. But in a sense, we need to digest the word of God. And with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he will speak to us. And he'll speak good things to us, sweet things to us, us, the message of salvation. Um, But they may be unpleasant things or pointing out sin or things that we need to correct. So some things may feel a bit bitter and we have a choice. Do we obey or say, no, I know better. No, thank you. That's not for me. I don't like that bit. Let's digest the word of God, be open to his leading and uh, what he wants to speak to us. And then we apply the word of God and that becomes the power and energy of God in our lives. So we can function. There's no use having power or energy. I'm reminded of electronics. I was fascinated by electronics, but I couldn't study too far. And now I'm on thin, thin ground here with Ben and others. Capacitor. The job of a capacitor. You may not never have heard of a capacitor. But anyway, it's one electronic component. Quite interesting. It stores energy. And I learned the hard way what happens if you misuse it, because I was trying to build an amplifier when I was young. And there were two big capacitors, and I was testing it with my meter, and I shorted something, and it was bang! And it suddenly released the energy. I didn't hurt myself, because I wasn't touching it, and it wasn't 240 volts or anything. But there's a lot of energy stored there. But if it just sits there, it's useless. It needs to go somewhere to have a function and serve a useful purpose, which it did and when it all functioning properly. We need to have a function, be working properly for Christ. And we get that, the energy from God's word. That's the nutrition for us. So, God has everything in control. And he's got a plan, his eternal plan, the mystery which has now been revealed, and we are living in that mystery, if you like. We shouldn't speculate about things that God hasn't told us so we can make up all sorts of things and they're all wrong and waste of time and just distracting. Now, the fact that there's no more delay, um, there has been several delays up to this point in the book of Revelation, which we're not going to go into. But um, in our lives, I think we often feel that there's delay in God answering. But we need to just wait patiently because the delay is not going to last forever including in God's big plan in the book of Revelation the delay is not lasting forever the time comes to an end and also um, like Crystal was sharing that beautiful uh, thought from John Bunyan about the desert when you come to the end you understand the purpose and God is and Jesus is carrying us And even though God's message isn't always pleasant to our flesh, he always does provide us the grace to be obedient uh, and be able to apply it. Now then, we move on to chapter 11, and I'll read a couple of verses, um, and we'll go quickly. Then there was given me... So this is straight after um, John's been essentially recommissioned after eating the scroll to prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings and noting that in the original there were no chapter divisions. So then we just take a breath and continue. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff uh, or a reed. And someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And I will uh, grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are etc. etc. Those two time periods, when you convert them, they are both three and a half years. So, Again, a lot of speculation on this, measuring the temple. And um, understanding, like I presented the overview before, if this is a literal third temple being built in Jerusalem later on, what does it mean? And um, so some interpreters uh, see this as this is, yes, a literal Jewish temple, as mentioned. 
and um, there are true worshippers uh, of God. We talked about the 144,000 last time, potentially Jewish people who are evangelists and um, preach the gospel. So pe some Jewish people have uh, been converted, accepting Jesus Christ as the Messiah that their nation has been waiting for. They are true worshippers worshipping in the temple, uh, but without perhaps the full understanding. Then what about the outer court? Then different interpretations, and this is where things can get really muddly. Some say that, okay, actually the temple's um, not really a literal temple, but um, represents the believing Jews or the whole believing church. And those outside, and if I understand right, they're talking about the outer court. So that's the temple holy of holies and the actual temple priest in, for the sacrifices, then the actual courts where the Israelites can go and women can go. But outside, this is Herod's temple, so the temple at the time of Christ, or the second temple. Outside, down these steps, is the courtyard for the Gentiles. And there is that barrier, the dividing wall, which Paul writes about in Ephesians, the dividing wall of hostility. So the Gentiles are outside. So based on purely actually what we read in the book, in the Bible, it's given to Gentiles to trample on for three and a half years. So is this actually referring to then the Antichrist and his people who are invading the Jerusalem and the temple? Um, but um, so... It can be challenging. Also, if you applied, uh, we could think about the outer court if you applied, and some people think that that's exactly what it means. They are Christians or Jews in name, but they are not believing. They are not born again. Well, the passage actually talks about trampled by Gentiles, so I'll stick with that. So, again, a bit of a wrap. Um, Measuring um, talks about punishment or conquering, vice versa. Sometimes it's seen as God's um, protection. The Gentiles trample the holy city for 42 months, so three and a half years. Then the temple and the altar are conquered by the Antichrist, as we saw earlier, and he ceases all the sacrifices. And um, Daniel speaks actually about a strange description, the abomination of desolation is set up in the Holy of Holies. In other words, um, the statute of, uh, probably something like the statute or the Antichrist himself goes and uh, goes where he should not go, the Holy of Holies, and declares himself to be God. So that's desecration, and Daniel talks about that as well. Jesus spoke about it um, in Matthew 24 when he was uh, talking about the end times to his disciples. Um, and he said, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, etc., etc. Some people see that this was fulfilled in uh, AD 70, when the Roman army destroyed the temple. And indeed, um, they took the Roman eagle into the temple and desecrated the temple. Um, I think this is... Um, like a preview or um, a symbol of what is happening at the end of times in the actual tribulation time. Uh, and that's an interpretation. Point being, point being, Christ is building his church. Regardless of what interpretation we take. And um, the question for us if we want to be conquering believers, is are we looking for our own comfort or are we looking for the power of God to be his witnesses? And that's a challenge for us. Um, I was reminded actually this morning as I was uh, revising there uh, before about this challenge about measuring, because measuring is understood in different ways. Um, and it can really be speaking of judgment or punishment or conquering. Of, um, in the book of Daniel, early on in the book, um, the Persian god, uh, Persian god, well, Persian king, who probably thought himself as god, Belshazzar, uh, was having a great big party, and in his drunken state saw this finger 
like a supernatural finger coming and riding some strange writing on the wall, which no one could understand. He was ready to kill all his uh, mystics and uh, wise people and so forth. Daniel was summoned and he asked for time and prayed to God for the interpretation. And he was, inter he was given the interpretation and he told Belshazzar what it means. Um, and just one bit of that, that you have been weighed and found deficient. You have been weighed as in scales and found deficient or wanting, found short. And uh, it says that Belshazzar, I think from memory, his face went wide and he was no, shocked at this. Um, and when Daniel interpreted that, in short, that night he, he was killed and his kingdom was taken away, given to someone else. So that's pretty strong. It reminded me though, let us not be measured or weighed and be found wanting in our faith, in our service of Christ, but serve him faithfully. Then we have the two witnesses which I've referred to dressed in sackcloth, which symbolizes uh, mourning and, and sorrow. The description, if you read, I won't read it now, um, chapter 11 talks about they have uh, amazing power. Sounds really supernatural. Well, it is supernatural power from God um, that they can destroy their enemies with a fire out of their mouth and they can uh, stop rain for, and it'll stop rain when they say and pray, then rain will stop uh, and start uh, when they allow it to start in effect. They can turn water into blood and um, strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. So that's pretty powerful and pretty horrible. They are witnesses for the gospel, almost like a final clarion call for people to repent. Um, and um, it says the whole world sees them. And in fact, when they have finished their testimony, then a beast comes out of the abyss. So probably Satan or then one of his hordes. Satan comes out and is allowed to kill these prophets. And then the people go, you beaut. And they actually have a great party. And they leave the bodies of these two people. And when it's actually in, in the hot sun of Jerusalem, to rot on the ground. And they send gifts to each other and have a great big celebration because these two people who have, uh, have been torturing them with all their, their message and all the things that they have done, um, they are now dead. Um, but don't even allow them to be buried, which is a huge insult in Middle East. And in the hot sun, bodies start to rot very quickly. And people see that and rejoice, but then the Spirit of God goes into them after three days and they stand up because they come alive. And they, there's a great voice from heaven saying that come up here and they are taken up to heaven and all their enemies see that and they are taken up in a cloud. A lot of symbolism or similarities to Jesus being taken up. Um, but um, they are not Jesus, they are two prophets, two people. Now, there's a lot of speculation, again, who they are, which is pointless because this is one of those things God hasn't told us who they are, but they are two of his prophets who um, are protected by God until the days of their ministry are over. And then they are killed by their enemies, but resurrected to life and taken to heaven to be with God. Certainly that um, if you want to speculate, um, and there's a lot of uh, different ideas. In the end, we don't know. But... Um, who, if you want to have two named people, uh, probably the best candidates from the Old Testament are who? Elijah and, Elijah and Enoch. Oh, yeah. Enoch. Moses is another candidate that's been mentioned because the signs are very similar to uh, Moses. Some of the things stopping rain, etc., is very similar to, um, to Elijah. I don't know what the, uh, they may not be either, any of them. Uh, Enoch, we, uh, there's not much about Enoch in the Bible, but it was said when he was at a great old age, hundreds and hundreds of years, he was no more because God has taken him. So it seems from the book passage of the Bible that Enoch and Elijah didn't actually die a natural death. They were just taken up to heaven with God. Now, we don't know what happened after that, whether they actually died in the process. Again, leave that to God. We don't know who these uh, witnesses are, so... No use sort of speaking too much about them. But they are faithful servants of God. And it is said that they are the two 
olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before me. Now, that seems strange. And again, um, we could look at a lot more Old Testament prophetic references uh, all through Revelation. And I haven't looked at uh, anywhere near uh, that many of them, but um, even for here, for time is short, we won't. But I do want to reflect on the book of Zechariah, um, which is around the time before uh, or during the building of the Jerusalem uh, temple, the second temple at the end of Babylonian captivity. Um, Zechariah was given this word, not by my might, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And then later on, for who has despised the day of small things? And a bit further again, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Backtracking. What this refers to, Ezekiel saw um, a lampstand and two olive trees on either side of it. And he asked, who are they? And they said, don't you know? No, I don't. <laughs> and this is the answer. Now, we are told here, chapter 11 of Revelation, that these two prophets, uh, these two messengers, prophets in sackcloth, they are the lamps, two lampstands and the two olive trees. So it all links together. Now, for us, it reminds us, again, not by power, but by, by my spirit, says the Lord. They had um, their role of witnessing and um, prophesying, witnessing to Jesus. Um, I will read um, right at, towards the end of the Old Testament, Malachi 4, uh, verse 5 onwards. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So not a very positive bit at the end. But, um, and the Jewish people knew um, at the time of Jesus, yes, they were expecting that Elijah will come. And John the Baptist, people asking, was he Elijah? I said, no, but he came in the power um, of Elijah. So again, the promised Elijah uh, to come, is it a literal physical Elijah or a God's messenger uh, with, the, with the anointing of Elijah and Moses, those two witnesses will come and bear witness. Uh, but they have a very checkered um, history. Uh, and they are powerful witnesses, meet a horrible end, but then are resurrected um, to the Lord um, in view of the whole world. So, we can reflect um, and uh, apply this in many ways. I don't want to take too long. I was hesitating on whether to put this up or not. Now, it's actually a quote from one of the earliest um, so-called Christian fathers, church fathers, Tertullian uh, or Tertullius, um, the actual the full quote. I mean, it was from one of his writings. The oftener we are mowed down by you, the more in number we, the Christians, grow. The blood of Christians is seed. And this is sometimes been stated as the blood of Christians is the seed of the church. And certainly through the history of the church over the last 2,000 years, that has been seen many times. And uh, in many countries uh, where people have been dying for their faith, a lot of people kill for their faith. But what do you know? The church grows um, and flourishes. So are we prepared? What makes an effective Christian witness? So just a few summary thoughts from some of the sources, and we will uh, nearly finishing there. This is something to, that we could all ponder about. And, uh, and I'm sure there are lots of things that make for or would help us to be effective witnesses for Christ. Worth noting that God often works through the small and insignificant and the broken, um, but they ultimately have the victory if we are in Christ. So do not belittle yourself, even like the message to, um, uh, through Zechariah. Do not despise the days of small things. We could apply it to our small group here. May this be a prophetic word from God for us as well. Do not despise the days of small things. God through his power, we can't do it, but God through his power can bring, and he wants to bring more people to him. And to be effective witnesses of God, we need exactly that, the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes it, not us. 
often people may need um, the salvation message explained to them one-on-one -on -one personally. People have observed uh, that people may have, in fact, some famous preachers who've been preached for years and years and you know, talked about and taught, taught about salvation through their church, but then found out to their shock horror that people actually didn't understand until someone explained to them personally. So that mm, was a bit of a barb for me as well. I mean, there's a place for teaching from the pulpit, but let's not forget the one-on-one, -on -one, helping each other to grow or our mates to understand the gospel message and what has Jesus done for me. And that's powerful. God is sovereign, not only in nature, but he's also sovereign over Satan's efforts to destroy us. He is powerful. God is in control. And uh, his plan will be fulfilled. Time and time again, we see in the book of Revelation um, that God is using judgments uh, to bring people to the truth. But judgments by themselves do not necessarily bring people to a saving grace. It is often the self-sacrificing witness of Christians, the followers of Christ, that will speak to the world. And indeed, when these two, um, two mighty um, witnesses, two witnesses in sackcloth, when they're taken to heaven, then there was a great earthquake in that city, Jerusalem, and 7,000 people died, and the rest gave glory to God, which is a change from before. Now, the Bible doesn't make it clear, did they actually become believers, or they at, at least recognized that there's a God in heaven who is in control, and above all of our schemes, and above the schemes of the Antichrist, or any other human agency, or indeed, the powers of the devil himself. Lord, we thank you again for your word. You have written a lot of things in your word which we find hard to understand, but Lord, take something from these two chapters, chapters 10 and 11 of Revelation, and speak to us personally. So it's not just interesting mystery for us to read about, but can actually become alive in us and speak to us and strengthen in our walk, following you and bearing witness today to you, Lord. Because still, there are many people who don't know. Let our lives to be a witness to you and help us to be faithful, true witnesses to your name. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that nothing comes against us that you do not have full control over. And you will not let us to be tempted or persecuted beyond what we can bear. And you have promised to be with us till the end of the age. In this we rejoice and thank you and look forward to the day when we are indeed joining in the heavenly worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.